Um, first of all, uh, this is overwhelming because I'm seeing uh, so many familiar faces in the crowd. I was thinking, oh, uh, this is probably, I thought about this talk and felt uh, this is probably the hardest talk that I have ever given. And with everything else going on, I think I'm just going to keep it very informal, to share a few threads, but hopefully that leads to a spark of a conversation. Um, the reason this is hard to do just personally for me is, uh, and I, I think for anybody <laughs> to think about is it's, uh, you know, our vulnerabilities and our uh, personal stories are difficult to share. It's not so obvious to me when I was thinking about it of what I should actually talk about. And uh, now having seen some of my friends in the room, it makes me a little more comfortable, so. Uh, I'll try to do justice to this in a context of something that's actually useful to some of you, uh, but most likely what might be uh, relevant is you will see some connection points that then you can ask me later and I can expand on that. Uh, so thank you for Orit and Sri and everybody else who's doing this initiative. I think it's wonderful to really be able to hear. I'm very excited about many other folks uh, that uh, you've selected uh, to talk about this. So I have really not prepared this at all. Uh, so I'll just do uh, uh, whatever I have in some sets of pictures that I put together. Uh, so let me just share uh, sort of where I come from. I was born in India. Uh, this is a photograph uh, of me with my mom uh, of where I was born. And uh, this is a town uh, called Shamli in UP in India. We, it's, it's North India. One of the things about this picture, just uh, this is probably the only picture I have from my childhood. So after this, you're not going to see anything just because... Uh, when I grew up, this was not so common to have a picture. Uh, and something that reminds me back and forth often enough of how I think about what role did my mother play in who I am today is really reflected in this image. Uh, this was our ancestral home, we grew here, grew up here for some time and then moved uh, primarily because uh, my father, uh, wanted us to move to uh, uh, a bigger city for our primarily our education. And that was a remarkable decision that he made at that time. Uh, but that also led to a sequence of events that turned my mom into being a teacher and then a professor at some time uh, starting to teach. Uh, but I think everything that I have learned about this profession and the passion for teaching really comes from her uh, attitude towards teaching per se. Uh, this is my mom and my grandmother now. Again, since I said uh, there are very few childhood photos, I have often revisited the places that I've spent a lot of time. Uh, this happens to be I think I would associate this place to be my grandmother's house, which is where I learned how to do science. Uh, and I think when I think back and go back to what is singular in at least how I think about science was driven by summer vacations. Uh, this is where we would literally spend uh, our entire summer uh, with no restrictions, nobody watching. And I think just my own personal reflection on when I think about how I do science is often with this criteria that you should do science as if nobody's watching. And I, I mean, it's, it's unfortunate. Uh, it doesn't have to be true, but when you do it, you should really do it in that spirit. Uh, those three months out of a year were probably the most remarkable times that we would spend uh, in summer primarily because uh, in a fairly rural setting, uh, but that really shaped at least my own personal journey on how I like to do science. Uh, a comment on kind of thinking about, of course, our parents shape a significant way of how we think. And I think I can't say that enough in terms of how I think about on the teaching side from my mother, but uh, something that I did learn from my dad, uh, which is 
uh, again, uh, a good lesson is he's all found with a pen and paper. Uh, uh, he would often at that time early on remind us that, you know, never be caught without a pen in your pocket. And often enough when I think about, uh, you know, I think about scientific tools quite a lot and think about what are the minimal scientific tools that we need uh, to never be caught without. Some of that really comes from his insistence uh, to a point it was uh, ridiculous sometimes that you're about to go to play a soccer game and he would insist you need a pen in your pocket. Uh, but it was just, just something that I've enjoyed. And uh, I mean, I think his habit of note taking has kind of uh, gone in, in that direction as well. Um, this is then uh, arriving at school. Uh, this is literally the only picture I have of my school and something uh, that I can remember from the time at schooling was Although most of the schooling, as many of you might have also experienced, was really about, you know, perform these sets of exams, I very explicitly remember spending a lot of time on uh, model making. And in model making, what it just implies are you're supposed to build something uh, that others would judge. And I think this was the moment I basically won this model making competition for the last five years consecutively. Uh, <laughs> And at that point, this type of a picture would be taken. And for the audience who are thinking, oh, what could be that precious gift that uh, you would give a child when you win a prize? Uh, it used to be tea sets. And that made my mother very happy, I remember, because it was only useful for her. And ironically, uh, but it did instill in me, at least at that time, that there are other things that are rewarded beyond your direct uh, grades, for example, which again, often enough has uh, reflected on much of the science that we do, especially when we're trying to teach. Uh, so I'm gonna keep going. Uh, this is then uh, back to my school. Uh, again, I don't have pictures of this, but what I was reminded by the last time I visited uh, uh, my old school, I ended up actually meeting the librarian uh, who used to sit with me. And libraries have played a significant role in, I mean, many people's lives. I think personally for me, because of course we grew up at a time of no internet, this was the place. And I think the only person I remember, the entire school, uh, I couldn't find anybody who would remember, including some of my teachers, but the librarian of course was the only person that both remembered. And at that time we shared a lot of time uh, because the librarian was your, Google. I mean, you would go in and say, hey, I would like to learn about parachutes. Then he would go out and spend 15 minutes and come back that maybe there is a book right here. So I think it's, it's kind of an important picture personally for me because I remember uh, this person's role. Um, very briefly on, I think, having early mentors in your life. Uh, personally, I've had my brother as an anchor. He's a little bit older to me, two years, and he literally saved my life many a times in uh, experiments that we conducted together. Uh, we have stayed close collaborators in some sense, uh, in a life journey in some sense. And I think one of the things that I've uh, enjoyed about finding an anchor like that sometimes in your life is also valuable. Uh, and I think uh, I very clearly remember my own personal experience, which I did not know at that time was science, uh, was under his guidance, he would let me do stuff that he knows he can pull me out of uh, from the edge of, uh, you know, not being safe. Uh, but it was a very important experience personally. And I think when I think about other people that I mentor, I think about him that you do want to bring them to the edge where <laughs> they are in deep waters. But on the other hand, you're there to pull out. And I, I mean, he's, I remember stories of him literally pulling me out of a fire at uh, one time, uh, primarily because of an experiment gone bad. Um, I think, let me, the other aspect of this has been just, you know, the way that we all do science is also driven by lessons that people who have gone before us have taught us. So that's my grandfather. He has been a Sanskrit teacher for the last, uh, for all his life, essentially. 
<coughs> he had uh, seven daughters and every single one of them is a teacher and my mother being one. And it was just, it was just an obvious thing in how I thought about uh, uh, being a teacher uh, was really, you know, kind of almost a family vocation at that time. Um, and on the right is my grandmother. And I think one of the things is about uh, providing a safe home for the summer where explorations could happen uh, was primarily driven by these two individuals. Um, I'm going to say a few words about uh, academic life now. I think uh, I... Manu, sorry to interrupt, but just to let you know you're at eight minutes now. Okay. I think I will probably close uh, with just two more things that I want to say. Um, academic life, I think I never personally thought of myself as somebody who would think about academia in any way and form. Um, it was primarily driven by a series of happy accidents, uh, which happen in all of our lives. Uh, I think there are two people in this picture that are very important to me. On the left is David Hubel. I did get a chance uh, to get a fellowship that allowed me to take a step back from everything I was doing. I think these three years of a break, I really, I wrote no papers in three years after finishing my PhD and it could, you know, you could call it a career suicide or whatever. I think this personally for me, it was very important to take a step back. And I think this time really allowed me to reflect on who I am and personally, can I do science that reflects my own, uh, my own self? And I think David instilled me in, in me this idea that uh, literally you really do have to follow your passion from day one. This is not something that you do afterwards. And I mean, it's unfortunate he passed away a couple of years ago. And then of course, the other and probably the most important person in my life that has taught me a lot about science is my wife, Sophie. Uh, she's a faculty at UCSF and is uh, the primary anchor uh, in my life. And I think something that I often reflect and struggle upon is also just the fact that, uh, you know, how to strike a balance between uh, science and fair share of work that falls on, uh, on our partners itself. Uh, I travel a significant amount because of our global health work. I think without her just completely complete support while also doing all the things that she does for her science uh, is, uh, I mean, I think this is something that I often go back and reflect on and see uh, how do uh, we support partners in our lives uh, to make sure that we can really bring a fair share uh, of support. And I think that yeah, just, you know, I, I fail miserably many times, but this is the one anchor in my life that uh, makes me do the science uh, that uh, I do. And I think the one biological experiment that we've done together is kids. And some of you who have kids will just immediately reflect on you. And for some others who have not experienced uh, uh, this joy, uh, I think this is another important lesson to do science as if you are a child. Uh, I think personally, I had not realized how much impact it would make on my own personal life uh, if I was... Uh, not spending time with children as much as I do now. So that's another lesson to take on. I think this is a very generic lesson that personally uh, it's made a huge impact on me. Uh, I will just end here. Seems like uh, I don't, probably not gonna talk anything about my science because the time is up, but uh, I am a scatterbrain and I am happy that way. Uh, half the lab we think about marine biology and then the other half we really think about the notion of making science more accessible to people and on that note uh, i will stop here uh, i think no maybe i should say a word uh, just on the lab side of the story which is of course the joy of doing science uh, and the privilege of doing science is driven by being able to work with just incredible young people uh, around the world that join in and take the faith. And I see a few of you in this audience itself, but one of the things that I just have to say is uh, uh, what a privilege it is to both uh, work uh, as a community together, but also uh, have them have faith in you, in uh, your uh, own mentorship per se, to really put uh, 
everything that they have uh, on the table as well. And I think it's just, I am just so delighted every day. This is really the reason uh, I do the science to begin with. Um, on that note, I will end here. And uh, this okay. uh, was uh, 10 minutes went by much faster than I had thought. <laughs> They always do. Thank you so much, Manu. That was wonderful. Um, we are a bit over time, but we have time for one uh, quick question, uh, and then we can take the discussion off um, on the small groups. If you have a question, you can just unmute yourself. I'll go for it. Um, <laughs> okay. I want to lob a you know a catch-all question to you, so that you know you can get to anything burning that you wish you had gotten to. Uh, what's your philosophy of science? Uh, why do you do the things you do? What do you think of in terms of impact uh, of your work, et cetera? Um, I think, yeah, you just gave me a second to share one last picture maybe. I think this is why I do science. This picture sort of represents just personally to me when I think about who will define the role of science in our society? We are at this crossroads. And of course, this was bound to happen and will keep happening with every single challenge that comes our way as humanity. And I felt very strongly, I mean, both from personal experiences and just the last decade in academia is we have to broaden access to science uh, as much as possible because uh, this bifurcation of what science is and science being done in a few places around the world really uh, essentially takes the true essence of science from majority of people on the planet. I think the, the reason this picture is important to me personally is, of course, science is just such a joy that you can see it in every young person. And what is it about it that uh, we take that away from them and how do you change that? And of course, the other aspect of this is how much work there is left to do. If you were to ask yourself, there are 2 billion kids on this planet, and what would it mean for all those 2 billion people to truly have access to science, just like you and I do, truly experience science in its aha moments. So I think you know that's really the driving force personally for me when I'm thinking about uh, what to do next. <laughs>